Hello, everybody. Um, so I am Atif. Uh, lovely to meet you. I am the CEO at Business 40. Um, delighted to be here with you, not least because uh, I don't know how many of you saw this, but um, in the FT uh, this morning or the day before, um, there was an article um, by a journalist on this very subject. And I think what she was saying was people should stop trying to find purpose. It's a load of crap. I think if I was to summarize what she's what she was trying to say. Uh, look, I disagree with her, but we're gonna we're gonna get into a bit later today why I think she's partially right and what people need to do about it. Um, so, um, look, before I talk about business four zero and why we're here and stuff, just uh, I thought it was worth saying a few things about this session. Um, please feel free to um, bombard me with questions, heckle me, interrupt me um, as I go. Probably best to do that through chat, I think. Um, uh, thank you to those who've already said hello. Um, but yeah, do, do just ask me things. I will try and keep up. Uh, I don't know how good my multitasking is going to be, but I'll try and keep up and answer things as we go or respond to challenges. Um, look, before I talk about Business 4.0, which I'll only do briefly, uh, just in terms of what we're going to cover, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a definition of what purpose is for business. Uh, I'm going to um, show you an example and talk about some characteristics of what I think makes a good one. And I think, you know, what what is... Um, what is it that makes a great purpose statement versus some of the stuff um, this lady in the FT was writing about? Uh, but also, I think the other issue is then how do you actually, uh, a great client of mine said to me yesterday, um, you don't want to be an organization with a great purpose statement. You want to be an organization that's driven by purpose. And so towards the end of this time together, I'll, I'll get into that subject because I think that's really critical. And, um, and again, most businesses don't manage to pull that off. And I think that's why this lady in the FT was at least partly right. Um, so um, all of that sounds great and um, uh, hopefully will be useful. Um, but before we do that, I thought we should just have some fun. Um, and I think the, the best way into this subject is actually to um, look at some purpose statements um, together. And I'm going to do this through the medium of a game um, that I've actually just played with an exec team. Um, I'm currently facilitating through this process um, of guess the purpose. Um, so please have, I, I think there's about 40 of you 41 of you watching this so i'm expecting lots of answers can you use chat to as i as i go through these to guess um who you think this purpose statement is for now i'm going to give you a couple of little hints and tips it's always worth remembering that a great purpose statement creates decades of stretch I, a great purpose statement doesn't necessarily describe today's business it should relate to today, today's business but it's probably describing if you've done it well the business you want to become decades from now so that may help if, you, if, if, if I start putting these up, it may help you think about who the business is. Um, all right, everybody ready? I'm gonna go on the first one. As I say, I wanna see lots of stuff coming up in chat. First statement, belong anywhere. Anybody know whose purpose statement that is? I might make it, oh, Pavneet, very good. And Fiona Young. Uh, it is, in fact, Airbnb. Now, I'll talk a little bit about, the, about these as I go, but the reason why I think this is so brilliant is a great purpose statement should set up the decades of stretch, should set up, uh, set up the innovation you're going to go after. When you think about Airbnb, and they've talked about this quite publicly, actually, because COVID's impacted some of what they were trying to do. Um, they had been very busy doing things that were well beyond property, that were localised, personalised tours to the area you are visiting, i.e., they were both driving the social impact of making sure people get to understand the place that they visit versus just arrive, visit and disappear. But also they were trying, they were building ancillary services that grew their business around the property um, and grew their revenue. So I think it's a great example. It's obviously, it's pithy, it's memorable, it's, but it really, it really focuses on the business they want to be and gives them loads of stretch in terms of um, stuff they could do and sell us that would help us belong. All right, very good. I like that. It was good engagement. I got at least, you know, six of you out of the 42. Let's see if we can get a higher proportion to go for it on the next one. So yeah, that was Airbnb. Accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Now, uh, that might be true, but it might be a bit more BP's business. There's a lot of BP's. You are wrong. You're actually in the wrong industry. Ah, Amina. Smashed it. I mean, it's got it. It is Tesla. It is Tesla because cars are not the point for Tesla. 
the point for Tesla is that they're going to learn as much as they can about battery batteries and battery power, as an example, in one of the toughest industries to look at sustainable energy and where there's an immediate business opportunity. But they're trying to do something much bigger uh, as an organization. All right, I'm going to keep going. It's very good. By the way, there's nothing embarrassing about getting this wrong. So well done, everybody that guessed BP. Uh, let's go again. Transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. Oh, I'm going to have to ban uh, Amna or Amina, depending on how whether I'm saying your name right. Um, but you are all right. It is Uber. So, you know, you could argue that today they're a taxi firm, um, <laughs> Uh, really by any other name obviously they've gone into uber eats they're looking at delivery as a business it's transportation and taking all the friction out of transportation that is what they're going after and there are and you just imagine the number of markets that could end up covering over the next uh, 100 years uh, also i just you know i think the stretch is really important it's everywhere for everyone uh, it's not you know it's it's uh, it's not a small ambition that so that was indeed uber okay well done everybody to embrace the human spirit and let it fly. There's a great, um, there's a great little clue in there. Casey, does BA ever make you feel like this? Come on. <laughs> Virgin, exactly, Virgin. <laughs> You're right, Casey, no, but BA doesn't make you feel like this, but, but Virgin does. And I think it's a great example, right, of every single service queue that Virgin has, everything it does, every touch point of the journey. I mean, I always think about, I've got a fear of flying. So I actually like BA because it just feels soft and comfortable and like I'm gonna be looked after and professionally. Um, but if I think about when I've flown with Virgin, even the way the pilot talks about what altitude we're gonna fly at and what time we're gonna get there, uh, embraces my human spirit and lets it fly. Do you know what I mean? They, they really, I mean, look at me, I'm smiling just talking about it. Um, and it, so they've really captured a point of differentiation and a sort of eternal, um, stretch in terms of the way they're gonna operate. So well done, that was indeed Virgin Atlantic. Um, la I think it's my last one. Now this is interesting, this is a bit trickier in terms of they haven't really captured very well what industry they play in, but they have captured the key difference between them and their two big competitors. One of their competitors is owned by Sony and one of their competitors is owned by Microsoft. All right, I'm not giving you any more clues. That was quite a lot of clues. Ah. Very well done, Navid. In one, Nintendo. I mean, I think what's brilliant about this, it, it, and Joe, well done. I, it, you know, it, I think it ought to describe a bit more closely the industry they play they play in. But it is. I mean, you can if you think about any Mario, uh, any Nintendo game you've ever played, and the difference between you know their take on a car racing game, Mario Kart, and PlayStation or Xbox's take on a racing game, um, it really captures the difference that they have, and it's helped them carve out a space where they're up against two behemoths but they've carved out what they're about. And every piece of innovation, if you think even about their hardware, uh, and it talks about everyone we touch, their hardware is stuff you play with. You know, you don't with an Xbox, you stick it stick it by the telly and grab the pad. But with a Nintendo, you've got the Wii, or you've got the Switch that you're pulling in and out and taking with you. So both the smiles bit and the everyone we touch bit, I think really speak to where they're driving their business towards and what they think they can create if they get that right. Uh, well done. Um, um, yeah, I, maybe maybe they should be called Nintendo. I kind of think it makes me smile just saying that. Um, okay, so Nintendo. I'm not going to do that. That's Kellogg's. Um, uh, so I am going to do this. So this, the turn every person, every employee into a person on a mission, this is our purpose, Business for Zero's purpose. And I guess I just wanted to say, look, just a quick bit about us. Um, uh, we believe that in our business that nobody should feel like an employee that that's a terrible spiritual and emotional waste, but it's also a terrible commercial waste to have loads of people sat in your business who feel like an employee. So even though lots of people don't like the word employee, um, uh, I think it's really important. That's sort of our enemy. It's, it's what we're fighting. And what we want to do is take every employee, every employee, whether it doesn't say any sector, I really hope one day we'll work with the NHS or with the Met Police or with the UN, um, but turn every employee into a person on a mission. Um, because we think that is um, unleashing from a human perspective and from a commercial perspective. Um, so look, we, we um, help businesses change fast in the world around them is changing. We do it by working with teams at three levels, with the executive team, with the two layers of leadership teams that often sit below an exec and with frontline teams. I won't go into the detail of that, but, but one of the pieces of work we do at that exec level is to help organizations not just set purpose, but do so in a way 
that becomes more than a purpose statement, which I will um, come back to. And look, I think this this topic is really important because um, as we've been working through COVID and Black Lives Matter and the many things that have happened this year, the environmental challenges that we're facing into better than we have historically, um, this subject of purpose is critical. Um, more is expected of us as businesses. Governments are going to regulate, customers are going to make choices, uh, talent are going to hold us to account. Um, and it's too important um, to me personally, and I think it's too important to all our businesses to be treated as some management fad. And unfortunately, I think it has become a bit of a management fad. And that's why, you know, there's no greater demonstration of that than the article that appeared in the FT this morning, um, which is making exactly that, um, exactly that, that push. So I thought maybe the first thing to do um, next was just to get into a bit of a definition of a purpose um, before we move forward. Um, so um, yes, and as I say, my contention is your purpose probably isn't good enough for the reality that we're now operating in. In fact, by the way, I think what's interesting is two of our clients who we did have done purpose work with in the last five or six years have come back in the last six weeks and said, well, we need to reboot and refresh our strategy. But that means we also need to look at our purpose and make sure we're really pushing ourselves hard enough. Uh, I've said that, I've said that. Right, definition. Um, so look, on the left is what I think is um, not a very good definition. On the right is um, our definition. So I think it's good, but you'll, you'll decide for yourselves. Um, so look, on the left, you know, your business purpose is the reason you have formed your company boil down to a single sentence or two. It can be industry specific or general enough to include ancillary and future business activities. I, I think that definition is a bit of a disaster because I'm not sure two sentences is okay. I think you end up with a paragraph then it never gets used as a business tool. And I think you end up then with this thing that is um, a purpose statement, not a, pu a business driven by purpose. Um, it can be industry specific or general enough to include ancillary and future business activities. Sounds a bit like it can sort of be anything and I'm not, I'm not sure it can, not if you want it to be really powerful. And, um, and so I'll go to our definition and there's a really key bit in here that I, I, I'm passionate about, um, please, uh, jump on chat and disagree or ask questions if you've got a different view. So look, here's our definition. It's a simple and stretching affirmation of the role we play in customers' lives. And, and, and it's defined in a way that will inevitably create multiple opportunities of growth and positive social impact. Uh, and I think that's really important that those two things, um, growth and social impact, become the same thing. It's really hard to do, but if you do it well, that's what a great purpose uh, definition does for you, is it makes them one and the same, rather than these two things that can end up tussling with each other at their, at their worst. Um, so I don't know, has anybody got any questions or reactions to that? Um, uh, don't worry if you don't, because if not, what I might do is um, get into uh, an example um, to bring it to life. I'm gonna give you a minute in case anybody does wanna ask anything or... No, okay, all right, I'm gonna crack on. So, um, first of all, let's just talk about, oh, Tim, thanks, Tim, could always be relied on. Um, does creativity or innovation come from that tussle? I mean, I think that's a great question. Uh, I, I, again, if anybody else has got a view, please chime in on chat and, and don't leave me on my own to answer Tim's question, but, but look, for what it's worth, my view is it absolutely does, you know. Uh, so actually, let me, let me, um, let me give you uh, an example from um, one of the businesses that we've worked with. So um, a while ago, we did some work for a company called Liverpool Victoria, who are an insurer, quite an iconic insurer. They've got quite a positive tone and take on what insurance as an industry should be. Um, and the purpose we worked with them to land was Live Confident. What I think was really interesting about Live Confident was it, it absolutely did this job of going, well, look, if we can help more customers live confidently. That means we'll be selling policies to more customers. It means they'll stay more loyal because we'll have taken away one of the key issues with the insurance industry, which is the anxiety people feel and the uncertainty that actually this industry creates when it should be there to take away uncertainty. Um, uh, so it, result, it, did, it was definitely going to grow their business. But, but one of the first things they did with that statement was ask themselves, well, who is it at the moment that doesn't live confidently? Because if we solve that, we can genuinely help, but also we can grow our business and serve a whole new group that's incremental to our business. Um, where it took them to was a whole conversation about um, uh, 
about patients with HIV, right? They were one of the groups that couldn't live confidently. They were considered an uninsurable risk. And what Victoria set about doing was trying to figure out whether you could use tech to measure adherence to the drug therapy. Because if you're taking your drugs with HIV these days, you're totally insurable risk. Uh, and I thought it was a really great example of something that, you know, would do something really positive in the world, but also would grow their business. Joe, I'm going to answer your question. So Tim, I hope that answers your question. Thanks for your question, Joe. So um, I, I, I think Live Confident does sound like a brand strap line. Um, I don't, they've never used it like that. They've never used it out in the market with consumers. And I do think um, there is a real difference in organizational purpose and brand purpose or brand proposition. I think brand purposes, even when they're called that, are in the end, their brand propositions dressed up. I was a marketeer, so I speak with some um, authority in the subject. And, and the thing with the brand proposition is it serves a particular purpose, which is to attract and retain a bunch of customers at a particular time. Brand propositions and brand purposes will change when they need to, you know, when they when they decide, well, okay, we're not attracting enough customers, they'll put in a new brand proposition or customers start saying they want slightly different things, they'll, they'll create a new hook. So I actually think you can call a thing a brand purpose, but it's not, it's a brand proposition and you will use it quite tactically. An organizational purpose should be in place for decades and decades. And you, you really mean it with conviction. It's a, it's a role you fulfill in the world. And, um, and so I think, I guess the difference for me is uh, sometimes purpose statements, as we saw earlier, actually are long, sometimes they're short. Um, I mean, belong anywhere. I think you could assume was a brand strap line for Airbnb. Again, they've not used it that way. Um, uh, consistently or very much at all. Um, so yeah, I would almost wouldn't worry too much about the construct. I think the question is, is this a thing that creates decades of activity that we're going to have to go after or is, is it, and, and, and is it, um, is it sort of an intent around which we're going to rewire our whole business or is it, um, you know, something we need to hook in some customers. We'll make sure we communicate it externally all over the place with the hope that we'll, that will happen. So I wish I'd said that because that's a way better answer than my incredibly long winded answer. Um, so yeah, thank you. Exactly. It is for life, not just for Christmas. Um, and, and it does require rewiring a lot of your business. So, okay. So what makes a great purpose? Pre keep jumping in with questions. I'll, I'll crack on for a minute. Um, so I think we, I said this earlier, but it makes societal progress and business growth one and the same. And hopefully that Liverpool Victoria example I just shared was, was a good one. Um, it defines where we play and don't play, um, uh, really good ones. So I think some, in terms of some of the examples earlier, you know, Uber are really clear, they play in transportation. I, I could have shared the Ikea purpose, which is to create a, a better everyday life for the many people. Um, they've defined both that they're about everyday living in that statement. They've also defined that the fact that they're for the many people, you know, they're a mass market business. And so I think the balance between this and the next point actually, which is, um, direct our innovation efforts it, it should speak to um where you play and don't play and create some boundaries you can't if you're a real if you have real conviction behind your purpose it isn't like you, you do everything in the whole world there's some things there's some there's a particular set of problems you want to solve um so it defines where we play and don't play it directs our innovation efforts i use the word direct very deliberately so again in that liberal tour example it started making them think okay who can't live confident and so it started to create some direction around where they were going to innovate but uh, as I said earlier, it also creates decades of stretch. So you just know that there is boundless opportunity for innovation. And the reason why that's so important is if you're serious about having a big role in the world, you'll have to innovate to go after it. And that is the thing that makes it the same as your growth agenda as a business, right? So I think people have sort of not really quite twigged yet in, in too many companies that what we're talking about is a new model for how you grow your business. The old model used to be go and find adjacent profit pools that you knew you could go and tap into and then grow your business and go after those any which way. I think the new model is to find a big stretching purpose that has decades of stretch in it and then evaluate all the opportunities and profit pools that opens up because you've got to do them if that statement is going to be true. And if you don't do them, that statement will become just, you know, fluff on a wall. Um, so direct our innovation efforts, creates decades of stretch, and then lastly differentiates us. You know, I think it's interesting. Uh, I showed the Liverpool, I'm with an insurance team executive today, and I showed them the Liverpool Victoria purpose earlier. And I said, it's somebody in your industry and they immediately got Liverpool Victoria because tonally it was so positive and about how you help more people live confident. And it was so obvious that that is what LV represent in the insurance market versus other players. So uh, sometimes that can be, tonal sometimes it'll be about your take on 
the particular market you operate in, but um, uh, like the Nintendo one, which I think was a great example of the, the, the latter. But yeah, a good one differentiates us. Just before I move on, has anybody um, got any questions about a uh, great purpose? What I'm going to do next is share another great example. Thanks, Vinod. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, um, it's a good question. I wouldn't specifically go, this is where we don't play. But I think um, in the way you define it, when you do it well, you're, you're, so if you take the IKEA example, create everybody, every, um, create a better everyday life for the many people. Um, it's implicitly defined already where they don't play. So they don't play in luxury. Uh, you know, they don't play in like, um, they don't play in furniture items that are like niche or, you know, they play in like beds, chairs, cereal bowls, you know, um, et cetera. So, they, so they've always by imp, uh, implicitly gone, right, this is where we don't play. And the same thing with for the many people, they've implicitly gone, right, we play mass market. That means there's a whole load of markets we've ruled out that we could go off. You know, they could have, as many brands do, launched in the mass and then gone, right, now we're going to do premium and et cetera. But they haven't done that. Um, uh, I was looking at an example earlier of Zero, the kind of accounting platform for small business. Their purpose statement just says, you know, they help small businesses thrive all over the world. And, and so they've kind of gone, we're about small businesses and therefore we're not about all the other types of businesses they could be. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you say it, but I think in the debate you have and the argument you have as an exec team, as you try and define your purpose, um, you, you, you are, um, You've got to make sure you're making choices and therefore you are ruling some things out in the way you define your purpose. Pleasure. Uh, all right, I've got literally no idea what's going on on timing and whether I'm ahead or behind. I'm going to keep going. Okay, good. Um, so um, we've talked about a definition. Uh, we've looked at some great examples. We've talked about the characteristics of what makes a good one. Oh, hi, Rob. <laughs> um, uh, internal or external? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, so I think um, organizational purpose, right, given it's a statement of intent and commitment around what you want to do in the world, is primarily a statement for you. It's for you and your employees to focus and get behind and get committed to what you're going to do. You know, I mean, I think it is in the end, whilst it's important to get a great set of words, it's all about actions. And so I think you design it. In fact, um, the team I'm with today asked exactly this question. Uh, so it is, I think you design it for your people, for your business um, internally. I think when you've got to the end of the process, sometimes what you realize is you've got something that um, could be really powerful in terms of um, A, representing what you stand for to other people, but B, could help you, frankly, set out your store and make clear what you're about and begin, even begin to influence some people. So I'll give you some, you know, so, so as an example, uh, a few of the clients we've worked with, that have got themselves to a place where they've got a purpose statement that um, really helps them reset their relationship with the regulator in a in a really regulated industry. Uh, so, you know, do you know what, uh, the best ones when we've designed and run leadership events to engage people in them, they've had the regulator come and attend and go, look, this is what we're going to try and do. We're not saying we're perfect. It doesn't describe everything about how we are currently, uh, but this is what we're going to try and do. And we want you to see and hear the conversation we have and the genuineness of intent we have behind this purpose. Uh, I've got an ex an old client who um, we finished the work and they happened to receive an aggressive bid, uh, aggressive takeover bid weeks after we'd finished the work. And so it interrupted their path in terms of really embedding this thing and generating action around it. But um, they started off in a position where their investors were in favor of the aggressive bid and they used their, um, not just their purpose, and I'm gonna talk about this a bit later, but what I'd call their blueprint, their kind of integrated story between purpose, strategy and culture they used that to persuade their investors that there was a real opportunity here and that they should back them to crack on with what they were doing. So I've seen people use it with the regulator. I've seen people use it in um, when they're in a takeover situation. Um, I've still not really seen anybody where um, they've managed to land a purpose, which then became their customer um, ad tagline or their customer um, advertising proposition. And as I say, I think that's because um, the two things are trying to do very different things. So yeah, sometimes um, that might be appropriate. I think what is important is if you're going to have a new advertising campaign, for example, or a new load of marketing material, the brief to the agency should center on, well, this is what we're trying to be in the world. 
Now, here's a specific problem around uh, attracting customers right now. Can you use those two things to get us to a place? You know, so your advertising work won't be dissonant, can't be dissonant with the purpose. But I think it's very rare that you end up with the same thing doing both jobs for you. I hope that answers the question, Rob, and lovely to see your name pop up. <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, such a flatterer. Okay, right. So <laughs> um, let's get into... Um, uh, I was just going to give you a worked example. And I think the critical thing uh, as I go into this is that it's not just about purpose. I think I think this is the point we were talking about earlier, which is just having a purpose statement, frankly, achieves nothing. And there's no real intent behind it if you don't then use it to drive down into your strategy. So if the purpose is, you know, why do we exist? What's our role in the world? Then your strategy should be, well, what are we going to do to make sure we actually fulfill that role and grow the business at the same time? And your behaviors or values, uh, I've got a view that it's behaviors, we'll come back to that, are then all about um, defining how we're all going to need to operate in order to deliver on that strategy so that we fulfill our role in the world eventually. And so I think, I think you know, one of the points I wanted to make is you've got to integrate those things. My, my biggest failure was um, at a uh, large UK bank when I first started doing this type of work. And we didn't. We never, you know, BCG did the strategy and we did the purpose and values. And uh, the purpose and values became the soft, fluffy crap that nobody paid any attention to while they went after the strategy. So you have to work really hard integrating them. You've got to be real about the fact that you're going to um, create strategic drivers that help fulfill the purpose, not just help grow the business. Um, so and this is TSB's uh, blueprint. I don't know how many you know of them, but they're a um, mid-tier bank in the UK, um, spun off from the Lloyds Banking Group, used to be a brand historically in the UK market in their own right before joining Lloyds and then came out again. Um, we started working with them when they'd had a, a few issues around um, uh, that were you know in the public domain around um data and it issues and, and also where the kind of promise of being spun out of lloyd's and what that could mean for them as a brand in the uk market again um just hadn't quite lived up to what had happened in reality and then had some big problems as i said and so you ended up with a group of six seven thousand employees who i think were they'd lost a bit of belief um they felt a bit beaten down um, they still believed fundamentally in what their business could do, um, uh, but that's the sort of state they're in. And a new CEO trying to revitalize the business and to use her words to get everybody running through walls to go deliver what we were going to deliver. Um, so look, so here's the TSP blueprint. Their purpose is money confidence for everyone every day. It's really simple, you know, and it speaks again, I think like great purposes, it speaks to who their market is. Their market is the people or businesses that don't feel confident about how they handle their money. Um, and I think this is quite a, you know, this is like of a human way of thinking about what their role is versus a banking way of thinking about what their role is. Uh, you know, this is the reality for many human beings is money is one of the things that most is able to remove, destroy your confidence, not just in money, but in life. Um, and if you can get it right, it really helps build your confidence. Um, so, and I think the stretch here is, you know, actually anybody that feels like that, they want to go after it's everyone and it's also every day because money affects you know unlike a lot of other categories um it affect it you know it touches you literally every day um and so every day there are moments where we can either help improve your money confidence or or destroy your money confidence um so that's that's their purpose um and you know obviously it's led them into debate so actually if you look to the left as a good example of some of what they've done if I take you to the bottom first, you know, the during COVID, they've created and launched uh, com a campaign around money confidence in partnership with with uh, not uh, with the Citizens Advice Bureau. So they're beginning to do meaningful stuff already, and they they started this in September, uh, and obviously then quite soon afterwards, COVID happened. But they've really gone for let's start doing meaningful big things that mean we deliver this purpose. Um, their, um, I'll just talk briefly about their strategic drivers that underpin that. So there's no way they're gonna be able to invest enough in money confidence for everyone every day if they don't as an organization become really focused, really fit and really fast. So they've got to get lean and stay lean so they can invest in the right places. They're also gonna get lean and stay lean so that the internal operations of the business don't end up um, creating confusion and a lack of confidence or an anxiety for um, their customers. Every experience money confident is about saying the nature of this purpose is every single touch point a customer has with our bank, uh, whether it's the, the contract wording or whether it's what happens when they go into branch or how the app functions, 
um, has to increase money confidence. So we're going to have to rewire every customer journey in the business. And as we launch new services and products, make sure they build money confidence. And then digital inside and out was just about saying that we've got to allow people to um, be confident in any channel. And that actually isn't just about whatever appware we put out to customers, but also what happens internally. Um, I won't go into the behaviors because we don't have time, but you can see there's then behaviors that really clearly underpin those drivers, you know, so you've got a real golden thread that goes goes through this whole um, blueprint. When they launched this to the business, it's just worth saying, in the first six months, um, employee engagement increased by 6%. Um, it's worth saying that from our experience over the last 10 years of doing this type of work, that is, whilst very good, is the lowest increase in employee engagement we've seen in the first six months after you engage an organization in the right way in this stuff. Uh, pride increased in this organization had really been lacking that by 10%. Um, and as I say, they not only did the Citizens Advice Bureau work, but they've also launched their first ever responsible business strategy, the Do What Matters plan, which as you can see, links to one of their key behaviors. So I just wanted to share that as an example, just to bring it to life. I know we've looked at a few along the way. Um, I think if I'm right, we've got about six minutes left. Um, so what I was gonna do for the last five or six minutes was just talking about, talk about this, you know, the, the, if, if part of how you create a purpose statement that's meaningful is, and that drives the business is the creation of the statement, just spend a few minutes talking about, well, how do you move from being an organization with a purpose statement to an organization that's actually driven by its purpose? And what I think some of the other things you have to do are to make sure that happens. Does that sound okay? Or alternatively, I could just, you know, stop talking and you could all fire lots of questions at me um, <laughs> and I could try and answer them uh, in the last five or six minutes, five or six minutes, if you, if you fire them at me over chat. What would you rather? If you've got questions, fire them at me. All right, what I might do is talk a little bit about the kind of integration piece I wanted to talk about. And if I see any questions come in, I'll answer them. And I'm hoping like everybody's awake and not off making a cup of tea. Um, thanks, Aggie. Oh, what, that's a great question. Just reading these all. Okay, um, so let me answer Aggie and Eva's questions, and then let me see if there's if I've got a minute to tell you a bit more about integration. So, um, what do organisations find most challenging when thinking about purpose? I think they find it really difficult to think ambitiously enough. You know, um, they don't. I think organisations tend to think quite incrementally and quite safely about how they might grow their business, and that's really different to going. What's the big problem we're going to solve that we're going to go after? And it's and and often that involves saying something. So, if you take Kellogg's purpose nourishing families so they flourish and thrive i mean lots of people would go well you don't you just sell sugary cereal don't you but actually i think it takes courage to go well our portfolio is what our portfolio is we are going to shift it over the next however many decades and we really mean this so i think it takes the sort of level of courage and ambition which is not incrementality yeah and i think i think being brave is absolutely right Aggie. um so i think they find that to be honest i still think the biggest challenge is they don't integrate they don't actually then drive it into strategy drive into behaviors Look, my, my big pitch would be every business is, if you do purpose properly, your annual planning process should start with the purpose and the strategic drivers and go, right, where are we at against this? And what are we going to do differently? Every team should sit down every six months, pull out the blueprint, like the equivalent from TSB and go, right, where are we at against this? What are we doing in this team about that? Um, and how well are we doing currently or not? It's a business tool. The best organizations never put it up on a wall. They never put it on the back of a business card. They don't need to because it's a thing leaders talk about all the time and it's built into the processes for how we drive the plan, the business. And I think that's, I think that's really critical. You know, it's dr driven into performance management, but, but I, I, for me, if I was going to pick one, I'd go the critical one is into the business planning process, into how teams think about what their work is and into people's objectives and you hardwire it in. Um, and I think organizations find that tough. Um, and then lastly, um, exactly, God, people keep answering things much better than I say them, bake it in and it's not for Christmas. Um, and just on Ava's question, um, get, how do you get the behaviors change against the values? So I think it's interesting. I, I don't think you should put in place values. I don't think any organization has any business setting people's values for them. They have their own values. I think you want a diversity of values and the, you know, in a world where we want more diversity, you want somebody who, who 
values efficiency and somebody else who values expansive creativity to work alongside each other in, in your business. I think you should set behaviors as TSB did, um, really specific, three or four, so people can remember them under pressure and actually act on them. Um, and so you don't end up with a world where we've all seen four or five values with like three or four behaviors under each. So now I've got to remember 12 to 20 things under pressure around how you want me to operate. I'm just not going to do it. There's not enough time in the world where we're all more cognitively overloaded and emotionally overloaded uh, between all the things happening in the world and our businesses are having to do more. So people are not going to remember and think about big conceptual values. You need to tell them the three or four behaviors you need to see. And I think it's the exec team's job to get specific and strategic about what those are that we need to see in you. Uh, we don't have time to talk about this. I think uh, ultimately this whole exercise actually is take input from lots of people, but it's the exec team's job. They need to define it. They need to have conviction behind it. They need to really mean it. People look in their eyes and go, do you mean it? Um, and then uh, in terms of how you make sure everybody buys in, I don't have time to talk about it, but I think you have to, be, you can't just communicate it out to people and they will get ownership from the way you roll it out and engage in it. Uh, Vinod, I'm, in the last 30 seconds, I'm gonna answer your question. So um, I wouldn't, I don't think. Um, I, I wouldn't have different purposes. And I think the organization exists to do something. I think every team needs to have a conversation, which is, okay, look, if that's our purpose, what's our role? What's our bit of what we do to make that come true? Uh, but I wouldn't have different purpose statements all over the place. There's already far too much confusion. You know, and when we've had the most success with this, we've taken organizations that are 50,000 people and they say, we moved from a world where we were landing 76 planes and we couldn't make sense of what was going on to a moment of blinding clarity where we landed with, there was one plane, we could see it, we could land it. And I think if you do this kind of work well, you create that level of clarity and, uh, uh, you know, around a global organization. So yeah, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do loads of them. You just create more confusion. Pleasure, Vinod. Uh, look, pleasure, everybody. I think um, we are out of time, bang on time. Um, I'm sorry if it wasn't as interactive as it could have been. I tried. Um, and um, it's lovely to meet you all. And look, if you want to link in with me and talk further, then I, as you can tell, I am massively passionate about this. I think it's important and we have to get it right. And actually, most businesses are not getting it right. Um, good. I'm glad you enjoyed the quiz. All right, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Lovely to uh, Lovely to meet you. Bye-bye. I can't leave. <laughs> <laughs>